We're here for the next in the series of interviews celebrating 10 years of synesthesia. Today's theme is disruptive technology, and I'm going to be speaking with Di Deputy Media Director and Head of News for the European Broadcasting U Union, Liz Corbyn. Liz, you're in Switzerland now, but your role has, has taken you, if not around the world in, in your working capacity, then certainly working in the international field of news. Um, you've worked in the news field for over 20 years, I think. Um, <laughs> and we're here today to talk about how the changes that you've seen in your professional field, how they've been affected by those simultaneous changes in technology. Um, you know, in 20 years, there are so many examples that I can pull out, but, you know, we've gone from those really now very retro cool handsets that you go like that on and have to put the aerial and we've all got, um, we've all got smartphones. Now, so much has changed and the thing we're intrigued to find out today is how that's affected this field of news and news reporting. So um, I hope you've got lots of juicy anecdotes ready for us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> many. It's been, a, it's been a huge change over the last 20 years, I agree. You know, you talk about uh, the handsets we were using, but we really, were, we were just using them to, to call people on. And, you know, we were filming on tape um, and, uh, and and cutting on tape. And, and now, of course, everything's digital. And now all of the platforms you can get your news on has completely changed. So, yes, it's been, it, it, when you put it like that, it has been uh, an immense change over the years. Yeah, literally when you said that about cutting on tape, I had a black and white image in my head, um, so, <laughs> which is a bit exaggerated. <laughs> it's a bit exaggerated. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, yeah, remarkable. So let's start with this. In those 20 years, in your experience, what's changed about how you find out about news stories? That's, that's really where I'd like us to start. Absolutely. So I've always worked in broadcast news to start with. So um, the vast majority of which has been in television, um, but more recently um, also in um, digital and online news. <clears throat> and, um, you know, when I started, the way you found out about things was local newspapers would have, would often be the first with the story. And that would be in a printed edition of the newspaper. Um, and maybe that would work through to the local television and radio stations. And then um, national outlets would, would also um, uh, get onto the story. Um, you know, not only was that a kind of 24 hour or in some cases weekly news cycle, um, it's now, of course, completely different in, in terms of uh, how and when you can find out about news. Um, from the broadcast point of view, um, the evening television news bulletins still hugely important in, in most and the majority of countries, um, but are no by no means the only um, time that people consume news. Um, and people want updates on things quicker. They uh, set all sorts of alerts on their phone. They get their news from all sorts of different platforms and different sources. Um, and yes, we can talk about this a lot, but it, it's, it's, it has massively changed how we do journalism and how audiences um, consume news and where they get it from. One of the things you said then was about how it's changed how people have consumed news. I'm gonna use the word competition there, um, you, yeah. while well, you work in a, a public service environment, but I mean, use the word competition there. How has it changed the nature of competition for you, um, these, you know, the well, disruptive technology? Public, public service media obviously has, has a huge number of competitors and that has, has only expanded uh, in recent years with, with that more direct access to audiences. So um, some people will describe the media as a filter of news. I would prefer to describe it as a curator of news uh, and, and a place where you can, you can trust um, uh, the news that you're consuming. But the fact is you can get um, news and information um, from a very, very wide variety of sources. With this information and the way um, information in general spreads, um, audiences have access to all sorts of information. Not all of it is trustworthy. So it is important stuff that's going around on on, on mobile platforms on uh, on the internet is is important in the in the whole of the news industry um, because what audiences consume uh, matters to journalists um, and matters to to us in terms of the way that we serve audiences with quality news content. So to understand from that Manila correspondent what this fake news is that's going around in in the Philippines at the moment is really, really important. 
Uh, it used to be the fact that, you know, you would never you would never call in with that. You would just ignore it because you discovered that this information wasn't true. But now that's that's changed and we have to deal with that sort of content um, and help audiences through the huge amount of information that's out there. So you said before that you prefer to see the news outlet as a curator of news. Perhaps it's almost more accurate to say that you like to see it as a responsible curator of news, really the place where if you want to know what's true, let's leave disinformation at the door, this is where you come to. Exactly. So, um, you know, some people feel, oh, well, I, can get, I can get this unfiltered information um, because I can go on Twitter, I can go on Facebook and I can see it from the, the real sources and, you know, I can make my own decision about what's true. Um, actually, we discover that all the, in all of the research that's also been done around this is actually people really appreciate um, quality, trusted news organisations to curate content for them so that um, they can consume which bits of it they want to and in the format and on the platform they want to. But the fact is that somebody has taken a second look at it and worked out whether it is, in fact, reliable and worthy of of, of your consumption of your time because um I, I i've often told my teams um in various um uh, in various places that i've worked um that news is in many ways a form of entertainment it is you know the competition that you have for consuming news is now very different so it used to be oh well the news is on at six o'clock or seven o'clock or whatever and your option was to switch over to another channel at that time but now on your phone you've got social media platforms or music or gaming or or um, uh, Netflix or another streaming provider. You know, the, the, the competition to news is huge. So I feel like we as journalists have a responsibility to make that news as attractive as, a, as possible because the competition to people consuming news at all is really high. I wondered if, m maybe not from this role, but maybe from some of your previous roles, if you've got any examples of changes that were made to those bulletins in format or style or content as a way to combat this new competitive environment and to keep the attention of, of your viewers in, in the way that you just described. Yeah, there have absolutely been changes and we've learned a huge amount from um, the digital content that we've been producing over the last five to 10 years. So the thing is with television, yes, you can get television ratings. You can sometimes see kind of down to 15 minutes how long people are watching for. Um, people write in if they're not happy, um, but really that's the only feedback you get. You, you know how many people roughly, and it's not even a precise number, it's, a, it's an extrapolated number, um, how many people are watching your evening bulletin and uh, you know if they complain about it. Uh, and that's basically the only feedback you get. On, online, when you, put, when you post videos online, you get a vast amount of data coming back. Now, it can take some time to work out what that data actually means um, and how to analyze it, but that has taught us a huge amount about how to make um, videos that people want to engage with, that people will stick with. Um, and what, what we've done um, in the television news industry is to bring some of that learning um, from what we've been doing in the digital space into our television bulletins. So an example, I worked, I worked for about 10 years in, in television news bulletins, and I could, I could tell you, you know, Five years ago, 10 years ago, I, I could make a television package, as we call it, a television report standing in my head. I would know exactly how to structure it, you know, exactly what all the rules were of, of creating that sort of content. Um, and we put it out and, and that'd be great. Um, and everybody would say how, how great it was because the only feedback you got was from colleagues and from peers. Um, and then suddenly we, we were faced with this huge disruptive influence um, from... Uh, of, of putting um, video online and we were learning about what that these these television formats were not working at all online and it made us really question whether they were working on tv you know what what is it that um you know we were assuming that the the audiences were enjoying and liking and appreciating well, well maybe they weren't maybe they weren't engaged with this it's just television is actually a stickier product, as in once you're watching it, it's quite an effort to switch over and try and find something else. 
Whereas, uh, because if you just wait long enough, then the television will bring you something different if you just sit there. Whereas online is a product where you're a much more active user and you have to, if you don't like what you're watching, you have to go and click on something else. So it, it's a different, it's a different user experience, but it made us think, well, what about making um, videos differently for television? Maybe we could um, uh, find new ways and, and employ some of this, this different, um, these different techniques uh, into television. And that started to happen. And you started to see things changing on television um, uh, it, it, in a way that hadn't changed, frankly, for decades. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, and then technology also really um, helped in, in many, many ways, you know, smaller cameras, um, uh, uh, more editing, uh, you know, really sophisticated editing software really allowed people to experiment. So I'm going to push you a little bit here, Liz, because everything you, I, I love everything that you've said, and I've got the idea in general, but can, can you illustrate it for me? Um, you know, you said the rule book went out. So what, give me a practical example. What yeah, did, okay. so what did if it look you, like? Yeah, so if you're making a TV report for um, television, right, you might open, um, or the way you structure it, um, you may not have the punchline, so to speak, or a key thought until halfway into the package, towards the end of the piece. You might open with a big, wide, beautiful sunrise landscape picture. On digital, you have got two to three seconds, really, to grab a viewer's attention right at the beginning of it. And frankly, a landscape beautiful sunrise isn't going to do it for anybody. And they, they watch that and they literally give you two or three seconds. The audience gives you two or three seconds and then they're off. They're not interested. You've got to grab somebody all the time. So, uh, and that and every 10 seconds, we, we, we gathered but probably about every seven to 10 seconds, you've got to be giving some, the viewers something that's going to stop them going away, that's going to make them hang on. Because remember, you know, they've got, they've got their mouse in their, in their hand or they've got their finger hovering to tap. You know, they are going to go away at any point um, uh, and you really risk of, lo of losing them. So the engagement of the viewer with a video is really very, very different online to what it is in TV. And then you think, you know, um, uh, but but TV news bulletins, and this I will give you a kind of personal example, getting that they are amongst the, the most prestigious, but also traditional and slightly risk averse um, parts of any broadcaster. Um, they have very loyal, dedicated audience and often very high profile audience. Have you seen a change as well in language that reporters use mm. as a way to connect with their audiences? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and that's been a very deliberate change as well. Um, that conversa a conversational tone is, of course, much much more approachable, warm way of talking to your audiences than um, talk than lecturing, talking at your audiences. Um, uh, you know that's why, if you think traditionally, breakfast television, and um, particularly breakfast news, has has traditionally been a lot softer in tone, a lot more conversational and been hugely successful. Um, let's talk a little bit about how the changes in technology have brought about a change in how you can actually record material. Um, I'd love to hear some of like the real technical nitty gritty on, on, on what's changed. Uh, so anybody, including journalists, but anybody at all can, can, can record a certain quality of, of stuff that can easily go out um, on, on professional media. Um, in terms of what the professional media do, they make use of all of these technologies. So yes, every every journalist carries a smartphone. A lot of the pictures that you'll see, photos and video, will be um, will, will have been recorded on a um, mobile device. Um, there are of course more sophisticated, more expensive um, uh, equipment that makes the really beautiful pictures um, that you will often see um, in. Uh, in television news um, and in documentary making. And um, of course, the craft skills needed to operate that kit um, is, are, are, are still at the level that the that, that craft skills have, have always been and are cru crucial to our industry. Um, 
so um you know yes i mentioned i mentioned edit suites we still have edit suites they just don't have a whole deck of tape machines in them anymore they have um they have lot enormous screens and and uh lots of computer memory in them um and the software that we um have access to of course is 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 gaining power all the time and, and that makes for for really create the creative side of what we do um really um very uh, inspiring and, and always pushing at the boundary. Um, in terms of um, uh, how you're recording in the field, um, often um, uh, you can now you can physically go out and um, uh, and record uh, the whole thing by yourself. You can be the reporter, the camera crew, uh, the sound person, uh, and then back at base editing it. Um, you can do the whole thing yourself, just like radio journalists have been doing for many, many years. Um, uh, TV and, and video journalists can now do that too. Um, but actually working as a team, television and video making is still best done as a team. Um, and I wanted to ask again, in this context of disruptive technology, breaking news, and, and I actually am thinking very specifically about, um, uh, you know, reports on conflicts, reports on conflict zones, war zones, that kind of thing. Um, but how has that, that breaking news piece really changed? The basics of it is still often a journalist somewhere, that might be for a news agency, it might be um, for a broadcaster, they're phoning in that story to the desk and the, and the desk is then sharing it with all of the, all of the outlets, online radio, television, etc. Um, to broadcast that story. So, you know, the basics of it remain the same, but the speed with which everybody has to work is completely different. So, you know, it was the advent of rolling news channels in, in the late 90s, really, that, that started this progression. Um, but um, it, it's been the same um, with digital outlets. You know, I'm sure any of you watching this will have probably at least one news app that alerts you on your phone to, to breaking news stories, you know, possibly multiple ones. And certainly as journalists, we all set gazillions of, of alerts to, to tell us about stories coming in. Um, but um, so the speed you then have to operate at, and that, that does pose some problems. Um, and, uh, and it takes really experienced journalists to to be able to cope with that, because when you don't have information, the temptation is to fill in the gaps. Um, and when a story is breaking and you are broadcasting live or you're live blogging or you're, you know, you're providing updates to whatever outlet you're, you're working for, sometimes there isn't any more detail. The demand for information is insatiable. People want it now and they don't understand why you don't have it immediately. So it's our job as journalists to not just tell what we know, but also to say what we don't know yet, the questions we're asking, the letting the audiences into that process. Um, so, um, you know, and, and it, it, it is quite interesting that still, although um, television is a, is a pretty old fashioned media now, um, on breaking news stories, people still turn um, in large numbers to television news because online just isn't delivering that same, unless you're streaming, of course, on your mobile, which is also part of the same television experience. Um, but kind of text and online just doesn't provide that same immediacy as, as knowing that the moment something comes in, it's coming into the ear of the presenter and they are just going to say it straight out on air. Um, and that's uh, that's an immediacy that television does still provide. Um, but mostly people will be alerted to the fact that that story has happened by their mobile phone. Can you think of anything in the in recent years, a news story that has been a specific catalyst for change in news reporting? I can't say that there's been one event, although a lot of things have have massively changed how we operate. So um, the conflict in Syria, for instance, um, had a, a very significant impact on how journalists operate in the field. Um, not necessarily from a technological point of view, but from a safety point of view and, and how they broadcast in that sort of very dangerous environment. 
Um, and it does tend to be out of conflict that you tend to get significant changes to how um, news organizations operate and they tend to, to collaborate on issues of safety and, and exchange experiences and, and things like that. In terms of um, uh, uh, technological developments, I do remember one broadcaster the first time they used um, artificial intelligence to um, identify VIPs. I think it was at a royal wedding um, in the UK and they used um, the artificial intelligence would recognize um, uh, celebrities and it would then kind of pop up as they were arriving for the wedding, it would pop up who the guest was um, arriving at the wedding. And, you know, that sort of thing, hugely valued by audiences. So yeah, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of breakthroughs of, of various different stories and things that you'll try things out on um, and then, you know, never look back, <laughs> never do anything differently again. I was just thinking then when you, to some of uh, some of your, your responses you've given that while what we're talking about is, you know, is disruptive, swift, agile technology, the advantage, one of the many advantages of organisations like the EBU and the BBC is actually something that almost seems contradictory, but is the structure, um, is the system. Um, because when you were saying before about breaking news and you said a story would come in and you've got the method to syndicate it, you've got the method to go, we've received it here and we can now instantly send it to, I don't even, I, I've got a number here, you've got 115 member organisations of the EBE, <laughs> so you can alter with the, I imagine with a very important button, send it to, to all of those <laughs> member organisations and in the BBC, you know, those, those are, are, are long arms that reach far that's something that can't be replicated. So even in this um, very sexy, very, very flexible modern world, those established structures are still very important, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the way the EBU works is that it gets the information from its members and then distributes it to all of the other members. Sure. So say there's a story happening in, in, in Italy, perhaps a, a, another prime minister who resigns, for instance, um, that, informa that information would come in from Rai, um, would come into the news exchange in Geneva, they would send us the pictures and the information, we would then flash that to, to you know, all of our, all of our members in, in the news exchange. And that sort of collaboration is really, really important to maintain. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been going 60 years, so we've been doing that every day for 60 years. Um, but uh, things have changed quite a lot in six decades. Um, and so we're finding new ways to, um, to share information, to share content. Um, because, you know, we all have limited resources. Um, you know, we, mo most of our members are using um, public money um and so it's really important to be as efficient and as, as possible with that and to give as, as you know as best value for money as we possibly can sure. um the um uh the thing we're working on now is um uh as i say we've been exchanging video and audio content for 60 years we're now working on how to share um text and online content between members which uh, given how many languages we uh, our members represent and operate in um, is, is a massive challenge. So we're using um, uh, automated translation um, to help with this, um, not, to, not to get to the, as the final product to the user, but to help um, with the sharing of stories and understanding of stories. Um, and so that audiences across Europe can have benefit digitally of the, of the journalism going on across the continent. What what does an exclusive mean now? Can something be exclusive? What has what has technology brought to that broadcast piece? What has it taken away? What does that look like? And please feel free to name drop some really good exclusive stuff in here for me. Thank you. Exclusives absolutely do still exist. Um, uh, sometimes there can be pressure on that exclusive. It really depends on the nature of the story. Um, so let's take uh, an example of uh, a story that, that a journalist has got, but the chances of it lasting more than a couple of hours before it's not exclusive anymore uh, are limited. So in the days where you had a, um, you know, you were aiming for a seven o'clock news bulletin um, and you got the story at two o'clock, there was literally nothing you could do with it until seven o'clock, by which time everybody else knew anyway. Um, the advantage of, of 
uh, the world we live in now is that you can at least get a couple of hours on your on your competitors um, in terms of uh, broadcasting that being being the first with the story. You can, you can spend some time working on that. But the fact is, you're not just editing one version of that interview. You're editing, to start with, maybe a half hour version of it, maybe a three minute version for the for the TV news or the radio news. Um, you're also you've got to also edit it for a digital platform where it needs to be, a, you know, a, a one to one interview is quite a difficult sell on the digital platform. You might uh, edit clips for social media, uh, in which case you want to look at, um, you know, some of them you, you'll want to be in a square format, some in a in a landscape 16 by 9 format. You, you can look at nine, 10 plus um, versions of exactly the same story. As we've talked before, there's a huge amount of competition to that. Um, so in order to get people's attention, it's it's really important to make those stories go as far as possible. Um, because the fact is, quality news journalism and, that produces those exclusive stories is expensive and takes a lot of investment. Um, and, you know, we can say that, you know, people can make up fake news in, in, in their bedroom, post it online and make, make loads of money. Yeah, we're, we're up against that too. And, it, and it's a very expensive business. So you want to make sure that as many people as possible hear about it. What do you think it looks like in the next 10 years? Look, I think things will continue to, to change at pace and that we should use all of the tools available to us. Um, so there's um, quite a lot of discussion about the use of artificial intelligence and, you know, do we really want machines involved in news selection or um, fact checking? Well, actually, do you know what used right? You know, why not use everything that we could, you know, that might be helpful to us? Um, to do things um, as we have always done with technology, trying to make the job easier, so, so that we can make the uh, we can invest in in more complex areas. Um, the um, so yeah, I see us continuing to change. I think there's no going back. Um, uh, the pandemic's also changed a lot as well. It's changed a lot for journalists in terms of how they work um, and uh, broken a lot of. Um, assumptions of change that would be difficult to make who was suddenly done in kind of 24 hour period um, so i think um consumers will continue con consumers audiences will continue to um uh want to access news to want to have access to the best possible information um and that we need to work hard to be um where they are when they need us um uh, to be providing that information. So I think, you know, there's, there are huge opportunities um, and we need to um, keep flexible. Uh, I think that's a big thing as well. Things have changed very, very quickly. Um, and in order to, to stay alive to that, to stay flexible, um, will be really the best way of us kind of keeping up with the audiences. And from a public service point of view, keeping up with our mandate. Our, our job is to be is to be there for our audiences and for all of them, not just for certain pockets of society. So, you know, we need to really keep keep our eyes focused on that. Sure, it's a, it's a big job you've got. It's a big job that the news industry has done for many tens of years. Um, it's an even more complex job um, now, and from what you've just said, it's going to continue. Um, continue to be even more complex flexibility may well be the key but then also from what you've said you know those those structures that governance you know things like having um having a mandate are also going to be equally important so there's a bit of a payoff there isn't there a bit of balance in in being able to deliver that service going forwards um, Liz, we wish you the very best of luck um, for our benefit <laughs> um, <laughs> as news consumers <laughs> um, as much as, as for yours. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing all of your insights um, and experience as part of this series of interviews. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure.